uh, starting at around 7.30 a.m. We flew out of DCA and flew to Dallas, Texas, and then took another flight to El Paso right on the border, followed by a four-hour car trip. We learned today that there are a little under 600 women and children detained at the detention center. Um, they are, um, many of them have been here since, um, I think, mid-July, um, and there are new detainees uh, coming in at the end of this week. And the makeup, the de demographics of the group is about a third from Guatemala, a third from Honduras, and a third from El Salvador. And we've seen some pretty troubling trends on the ground here in Artesia. Uh, what we know of as bond in back in D.C., in the D.C. area, is matter of Patel and arguing that your client is in a flight risk, that they're not a danger to the community. Here it's completely different. What they're seeing on the ground here is that attorneys are being, or clients are being required to basically present many merits hearings in order to justify their release. Um, to show that they're not a flight risk. And what DHS has been doing is submitting uh, materials and arguments that these women and children are national security risks. It is almost 11 o'clock at night and we've been up since 5.30 in the morning. Um, there is a lot that we experienced today and a lot that we want to share with you. Um, I think for us, a big theme for today was seeing the kids um, that are in this detention center that are in jail here. Um, this morning we arrived at the federal detention facility and we were waiting for the women to come in and to see um, these children, toddlers, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds coming in with their mothers um, really, really was very difficult to take. Um, and no matter how hard or how much you prepare yourself, for that mentally or you think that you have prepared yourself, it really, um, it just hits you. Uh, seeing kids in, in this setting uh, is, is just wrong. Uh, one of the things that Dre and I have talked about a lot is a lot of them are sick. Um, almost all of the children that we saw today and all of the other attorneys that we spoke to um, have experienced uh, talking with moms and, and of sick children. and. Um, uh, one of the women that I spoke with today um, came in to ask if there was anything we could do about, um, maybe she had heard about parole. Um, she had a six month old uh, little baby boy who since they've gotten here in July has been in the hospital two times on extended stays. He's had viral bronchitis. Um, he's back here in the facility. He's on a nebulizer on antibiotics, um, he's had allergic reactions, and they keep bringing him back to the detention facility, and as a human being, as a mom, um, to sit across from this poor child and his mother was just heart-wrenching. Um, and almost every kid in here, at, at the very least, seems to be having a, a, a cold. Um, there's reports of diarrhea, um, of vomiting, um, fevers, a lot of the kids have had fevers and ear infections and some have been treated faster than others, um, but many what we're seeing uh, trend wise is just so many of these kids have repeating issues and the way I interpret, it, that, interpret that is that kids are just not supposed to be in a setting like this and it's really, really embarrassing um, to America to be treating people this way. But also from a mental health point of view, um, us as attorneys, we're taking declarations, we're going before the IJs on bond hearings, on, on credible fear reviews, on merits hearings, all with the kids sitting right there next to their moms while their moms talk about all kinds of horrific abuse about how their children are being threatened and these little boys and girls are just being exposed to this um, 
really uh, difficult situation that I think is, is going to stay with them for a long time. So. And just hearing all of those horrific stories and then out of the corner of your eye seeing little kids coloring is just, it hits you. It's, yeah. And by the way, you can't give them anything. You can't bring them any food. Um, you can't bring them anything to color with. It's only what the ice guards will let them have. Mm -hmm. So another point of frustration. And Sandra started her day um, with uh, a, an inter in an interesting and unexpected way, I would say. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so first thing, I got here in the morning and I was introduced to a lady um, from Honduras who had a um, she was uh, denied um, during her credible fear interview for lack of, of credibility and so she had a review uh, before an IJ um, today before IJ Owens who was sitting in Arlington Virginia um, the first thing the judge did was basically challenge my um, uh, role as an attorney during the credible fear uh, review process and he made it clear to me that he didn't think that according to the IJ uh, bench book and the regulations that I had any role at all. Um, I managed uh, to make some arguments to him about asylum being discretionary and about um, how um, given the situation uh, there should be more room uh, for, for an attorney to be able to advocate on behalf of their client. Um, he did let me make some brief statements about social group at that point. Um, uh, there, there's a lot that happened during the review, but uh, I, I guess the most um, interesting point for me was that I.J. Owens actually asked uh, my client, a, a woman with five or six years of education, to articulate her social group, um, which is something that clearly requires um, legal knowledge and, and she was unable to do. Ultimately, um, he ended up deciding in her favor and she will be able to move forward and present an asylum case. But apparently what I saw today is happening in many of these um, credible fear reviews where the, the judges are actually asking the clients to, to discuss social group. 